Hello and welcome to the Cultured Bumpkin. And today we're reading Persuasion by Jane Austen, Chapter 2, in a Southern Accent. Chapter 2. Mr. Shepard, a civil, cautious lawyer who, whatever might be his hold or his views on Sir Walter, would rather have the disagreeable prompted by anybody else would rather have the disagreeable prompted by anybody else excused himself from offering the slightest hint and only begged and only begged leave to recommend an implicit reference and only begged leave to recommend an implicit reference to the excellent judgment of lady russell for whose known good sense he fully expected to have just resolute measures advised to have just such resolute measures advised as he meant to see finally adopted all right, and just a reminder, this is the live recording of this. Uh, when I'm done, then I will uh, edit edit it and put it back on YouTube as an audiobook. So that way, like I'm stumbling around on words and stuff, which I do, by the way. That's just, that's not, it's not that I don't make mistakes. It's just if you've heard any of my other audiobooks on YouTube that didn't have as many mistakes in it, it was because they're edited. Um, so this is the live recording. So then we have this, and it's fun, it's interactive, whatever. And then take the audio and make an audio book out of it for free on YouTube. You don't have to pay for it. <clears throat> um, you know, this economy, you just got to get free stuff when you can. You know what I'm saying? That's what I sure do. Uh, okay. Put my little banner right here. Yeah, subscribe and such if you haven't yet. Okay, back to it. Lady Russell was most anxiously zealous on the subject and gave it much serious consideration. She was a woman rather of sound than of quick abilities, whose difficulties in coming to any decision in this instance were great from the opposition of two leading principles. She was of strict integrity herself, with a delicate sense of honor, but she, but she was as desirous of saving Sir Walter's feelings as solicitous for the credit as solicitous for the credit of the family, as aristocratic in her own ideas, as aristocratic in her ideas of what was due to them, as anybody of sense and honesty could well be. She was a benevolent, charitable, good woman, and capable of strong attachments, most correct in her conduct, strict in her notions of decorum, and with manners that were held a standard of good breeding. She had a cultivated mind and was, generally speaking, rational and consistent. But she had prejudices on the side of ancestry, for she had a value for rank and consequence, which blinded her a little to the faults of those who possessed them. Herself the widow of only a knight, she gave the dignity of a baronet all its due. And Sir Walter, independent of his claims as an old acquaintance, an attentive neighbor, an obliging landlord, the husband of her very dear friend, the father of Anne and her sisters, was, as well as being, as being Sir Walter in her apprehension, entitled to a great deal of compassion and consideration under his present difficulties. They must retrench. That did not, that did not admit of a doubt. But she was very anxious to have it with the least possible pain to him and Elizabeth. She drew up plans of economy. She made exact calculations, and she did what nobody else thought of doing. She consulted Anne, who never seemed considered by the others as having any interest in the question. She consulted, and in... Let's see. Can you hear that buzzing horse fly? Because I sure can. She consulted, and in a degree was influenced by her marking out the scheme of retrenchment, which was at last submitted to Sir Walter. Every emendation of Anne's had been on the side of honesty against importance. She wanted more vigorous measures, a more complete reformation, a quicker release from debt, a much higher tone of indifference for everything but justice and equity. If we can persuade your father to all this, said Lady Russell, looking over her paper, much may be done. If he will adopt these regulations, in seven years he will be clear. Dad, come get out of here. You. I'm going to get that thing. I'm going to get it. You see. You, you watch and see. All right, let's see. 
If he will adopt these regulations, in seven years he'll be clear, and I hope we may be able to convince him and Elizabeth that Kellynch Hall has a respectability in itself which cannot be affected by these reductions, and that the true dignity of Sir Walter Elliot will be very far from lessened in the eyes of sensible people by acting like a man of principle. What will he be? I'm very sorry about all this commotion. In the audiobook, this will be edited out, of course, right? Uh, the buzzing flies, the, the shenanigans, the, the thrill of the hunt, so to speak, gone. It won't be in there. It'll be edited out. As long as I'll sit there, I don't mind. Anyway, <clears throat> so sorry. I don't know how loud you can hear it, but it's very loud, and I'm confident that it would mess up the recording that I'm attempting to make. What will he be doing, in fact, but what very many of our first families have done or ought to do? There will be nothing singular in his case, and it's singularity which often makes the worst part of our suffering, as it always... There it is. Dang it. If you're just joining us, there is a, a wicked horsefly in here who's determined to ruin this recording session. <laughs> Get out of here. All right. Let's, I think he left. Maybe. <sighs> All right. Sorry about all the commotion. Nope, there he is. All right, anyway. Oh, back to it. Again, in the audiobook, it's like this never happened. Um. There will be nothing singular in his case, and it is singularity which often makes the worst part of our suffering, as it always does of our conduct. I have great hope of prevailing. We must be serious and decided, for after all, the person who has contracted debts must pay them, and though a great deal is due to the feelings of the gentleman and the head of a house, like your father, there's still more due to the character of an honest man. This was the principle on which Anne wanted her father to be proceeding, his friends to be urging him. She considered it as an act of indispensable duty to clear away the claims of creditors with all the expedition which the most comprehensive retrenchments could secure, and saw no dignity in anything short of it. She wanted it to be prescribed, and felt as a duty. And felt it as a duty. She rated Lady Russell's influence highly, and as to the severe degree of self-denial which her own conscience prompted, she believed there might be little more difficulty in persuading them to a complete persuading them to a complete than to a half reformation. Her knowledge of her father and Elizabeth inclined her to think that the sacrifice of one pair of horses would be hardly less painful than of both, and so on. Through the whole list of Lady Gen through the whole list of Lady Russell's two gentle reductions. How Anne's more rigid requisitions might have been taken is of little consequence. Lady Russell's had no success at all, could not be put up with, were not to be born. Whatever comfort of life knocked off, journeys, London, servants, horses, table, contractions, and restrictions everywhere, to live no longer with the decencies even of a private gentleman. No, he would sooner quit Kellynch Hall at once than remain in than remain in it on such disgraceful terms. Quit Kellynch Hall. The hint was immediately taken up by Mr. Shepherd, whose interest was involved in the reality of Sir Walter's retrenching, and who was perfectly persuaded that nothing could be done without a change of abode. Since the idea had been started in the very quarter which ought to dictate, he had no scruple, he said. Sorry, man, there's just so many distractions today. So many distractions. Let's 
Something, something, something. Okay. <sighs> Since the idea had been started in the very quarter which ought to dictate he had no scruple, he said, in confessing his judgment to be entirely on that side. It did not appear to him that Sir Walter could materially, after his style of living, alter his style of living in a house which had such a character of hospitality and ancient dignity to support. In any other place, Sir Walter might judge for himself and would be looked up to as regulating the modes of life in whatever way he might choose to model his household. Sir Walter would quit Kellynch Hall, and after a very few days more of doubt and indecision, the great decision of the great question of whether he should the great question of whither he should go was settled, and the first outline of this important change made out. There had been three alternatives London, Bath, or another house in the country. All Anne's wishes had been for the latter, a small house in their own neighborhood, where they might still have Lady Russell's society, still be near Mary, and still have the pleasure of sometimes seeing the lawns and groves of Kellynch was the object of her ambition. But the usual fate of Anne attended her in having something very opposite from her inclina in having something very opposite from her inclination fixed on. She disliked Bath and did not think it agreed with her, and Bath was to be her home. Sir Walter had thought Sir Walter at first thought more of London, but Mr. Shepherd felt that he could not be trusted in London, and he had been skilful enough to dissuade him from it and make Bath preferred. It was a much safer place for a gentleman in his predicament. He might be there. Uh, he might be there. He might there be important at comparatively little expense. Two material advantages of Bath over London had, of course, been given all their weight. It's more convenient distance from Kellynch, only 50 miles, and Lady Russell's spending some part of every winter there. And to the great, and to the very great satisfaction of Lady Russell, whose first views on the projected change had been for Bath, Sir Walter and Elizabeth were induced to believe that they should lose neither consequence nor enjoyment by settling there. Lady Russell felt obliged to oblige. Lady Russell felt. Sorry. Lady Russell felt obliged to oppose her dear Anne's own wishes. It would be too much to expect Sir Walter to descend into a small house in his own neighborhood. Anne herself would have found the mortifications of it more than she foresaw, and to Sir Walter's feelings, they must have been dreadful. And to regard with, and with regard to Anne's dislike of Bath, she considered it as a prejudice and a mistake arising first from the circumstance of her having been there three years at school after her mother's death, and secondly, from her happening to not be in perfectly good spirits the only winter which she had afterwards spent there with herself. Lady Russell was fond of Bath, in short, and disposed to think it must suit them all. And as to her young friend's health, by passing all the warm months with her at Kellynch Lodge, every danger would be avoided and it was in fact a change which must do both health and spirits good. Anne had been too little from home, too little seen. Her spirits were not high. A larger society would improve them. She wanted her to be more known. The undesirableness of any other house in the same neighborhood for Sir Walter was certainly much strengthened by one part, in the very material part of the scheme, which had been happily engrafted on the beginning. He was not only to quit his home, but to see it in the hands of others, a trial of fortitude which stronger heads than Sir Walter's have found too much. Kellynch Hall was to be let. This, however, was a profound secret, not to be, not to be breathed beyond their own circle. Sir Walter could not have borne the degradation of being known to design letting uh, Sir Walter could not have been born the degradation of being known to design letting his house. Mr. Shepherd had once mentioned the word advertise, but never dared approach it again. Sir Walter spurned the idea of its being offered in any manner, forbade the slightest hint being dropped of his having such an intention, and it was only on the supposition of his being spontaneously solicited by some of the most unexceptionable 
and it was only on the supposition of his being spontaneously solicited by some most unexceptionable applicant on his own terms and as a great favor that he would let it at all. And of course, let means to rent. So they're downgrading their huge palatial mansion and moving into a smaller place and then renting it out. And they were just, this is horrific. How quick come the reasons for approving what we like? Lady Russell had another excellent one at hand for being extremely glad that Sir Walter and his family were to remove from the country. <clears throat> uh, for being extremely glad that Sir Walter and his family were to remove from the country, Elizabeth had been lately forming an intimacy which she wished to see interrupted. It was with the daughter of Mr. Shepherd, who had returned after an unprosperous marriage to her father's house with the additional burden of two children. She was, a, she was a clever young woman who understood the art of pleasing, the art of pleasing at least at Kellynch Hall, and who had made herself so acceptable to Miss Elliot as to have already been staying there more than once in spite of all that Lady Russell, who thought that it was a friendship quite out of place, could hint of caution and reserve. Lady Russell indeed had scarcely any influence with Elizabeth and seemed to love her rather because she would love her than because Elizabeth deserved it. She had never received from her more than outward attention, nothing beyond the observances of complacence, had never succeeded in any point which she wanted to carry against previous inclination. She had been repeatedly very earnest in trying to get Anne included in the visit to London, sensibly open to all the injustice and all the discredit of the selfish arrangements which shut her, which shut her out, and on many lesser occasions had endeavored to give Elizabeth the advantage of her own better judgment and experience, but always in vain. Elizabeth would go her own way, and never had she pursued it in more decided oppositions to Lady Russell than in this selection of Mrs. Clay, turning from the society of so turning from the society of so deserving a sister to bestow her affection and confidence on one who ought to have been nothing to her but the object of distant civility. From situation, Mrs. Clay was, in Lady Russell's estimate, a very unequal, and in her character she believed a very dangerous companion, and a removal that would leave Mrs. Clay behind and bring a, and bring a choice of more suitable intimates with Miss and bring a choice of more suitable intimates within Miss Elliot's reach was therefore an object of first-rate importance. Okay, we finally made it through. Finally made it through. Um, Mariah, hello. Good to see you. Uh, yeah, I had a fight with a horsefly. And uh, I don't know if anybody else has this, but where I am right now, it's really warm. And in the spring, a lot of the times, the, the ladybugs come out or some of their little cousins. Um, and there's ladybugs everywhere, flying around and stuff. There's that horse flag in. Oh, well, we're, we're done now. So anyway, uh, thanks for watching uh, the Persuasion Chapter 2. And again, I will cut out all the fights with the ladybugs and the uh, chasing the horse fly around here, throwing my hat at it and hooting and hollering. Um, that'll be edited out in the audiobook. So anyway, hope you have a great day and talk to you soon.